right? And such an important kind of rethinking or, or tinkering with how we relate to species in the in the kind of Western science sense versus on the ground in reality. You know, can I eat this? Can I forage this? Does this have a connection to, you know, my grandparents or my great grandparents? We see all the time, like we talk about management as a suite of practices. And we often just look at those mechanical functional aspects of management without considering, you know, the the social institutions, the relationality, the the you know, quote cultural aspects are, are often downplayed. Hey, hey, I'm Michael Yadrick. I'm an ecological restoration practitioner living on Puyallup Territory, now known as the City of Destiny, Grit City, Tacoma, Washington. This is Treehugger Podcast, where we discuss forest gardens, a historical and contemporary relationship people have with a particular type of forest. I know it's been a while, but this episode is worth the wait. I am pleased to present you with a conversation I had recently with an archaeobotanist named Chelsea Geralda Armstrong. Chelsea is a historical ecologist and archaeologist based out of Simshan Luckyup in northwestern British Columbia. She studies human land use in the past and how those dynamics relate to the present, particularly towards indigenous sovereignty and socially informed environmental justice and reclamation. Chelsea is assistant professor and director of the Historical and Ethno-Ecological Research Lab in Indigenous Studies at Simon Fraser University. I became acquainted with Professor Armstrong's scholarship only recently. My coworker emailed an article around about Armstrong and her co-author's study of forest gardens tended by pre-Canada's Indigenous people. These are places found near village sites, close to home, and composed of plants intimately tied to people. The trees and shrubs and herbs found in these places have been curated over centuries. They are not only scrumptious and nutritious, but they also provide for us medicine, tools, fiber, pollination, and hunting grounds. I will put a link in the show notes to their paper from the journal Ecology and Society called Historical Indigenous Land Use Explains Plant Functional Trait Diversity. While the article emphasizes the ecological diversity of some of the coolest plant species, in my mind it also lifts the hood enough to also give us a peek at the durability and survivance of the people who cultivate these forests still today. I had to know more about this story because I have also seen similar forests in Guatemala and Costa Rica over a decade ago. Western science might refer to these places as forest gardens or might call these systems by other names like analog forestry, agroforestry, or home gardens. They harbor incredible biodiversity, different from that of the outlying bosque or selva or periphery forests. From the get-go, Professor Armstrong and her co-authors refer to the forest gardens as novel ecosystems that have no natural analog. So, I was curious how she and her team and allies relate to forests that are composed of communities of species that result almost purely from human agency, environmental change, and the introduction of species from other regions. Armstrong told me that was her cheeky line about novel ecosystems because she is of two minds. The epoch we find ourselves in, whether the Anthropocene or Capitalocene, have been used interchangeably with the increase in atmospheric greenhouse gas emissions, the detonation of atomic bombs, and the Industrial Revolution, reflected mostly in a negative light as human domination over the landscape. Although some consider we have been living in the Anthropocene for 10,000 years plus, when our ancestors started tinkering with their relations, especially domestication of plants and animals. Armstrong sees novel ecosystems in this way, that different societies with distinct cultures and ideologies will impact landscapes in myriad ways. As an example, she describes forest gardens on a substrate of 2 to 3 meters of midden that otherwise does not exist without large-scale ecosystem engineering taking thousands of years of human labor and wildcrafting species of plants, perhaps transplanting them from hundreds of kilometers away. This episode lets your imagine run wild, really. We talk about our local nut-bearing species, hazelnuts of the non-latte flavoring variety that seem pretty close at one time to domesticating us, and how these short trees, small shrubs, compel us into relationship with squirrels. We chat about alternative food systems, the downfalls of scaling up, even the best ideas, how our plant relationships will help us survive the apocalypse, and much more. 
Glad to bring you this episode on Pacific Northwest Forest Gardens. It starts right here. Enjoy the conversation. My name is Chelsea Armstrong. I'm a historical ecologist and archaeologist and assistant professor at Simon Fraser University. I'm an archaeologist, but I'm also trained in botany. And I think there's about four of us archaeobotanists in British Columbia. And so it's kind of a novel field, kind of a very niche field. But I started my PhD research at Simon Fraser University at looking at hazelnut and looking at kind of the, the strange distributions of hazelnut in British Columbia and looking at it from an ethnobotanical and archaeological perspective. And as I was doing uh, my research, I was uh, invited to work in various territories, including with Jim McDonald, who's an, uh, an anthropologist that has since passed away. But he said, you know, come, come look at the hazelnut growing at this site in northwestern BC, and it became very apparent very quickly that hazelnut was part of a larger modified ecosystem. And so that set off my research directions around forest gardens and landscape management. And yeah, it was a pretty, pretty quick jump. Your relationship with hazelnut is interesting because I actually don't talk about hazelnut at all. I feel like with anyone, I'm so glad to be talking to you right now. And for everyone else, folks listening to the podcast, they may be listening in like other countries. Let's just pretend it's like Australia or England. When you say hazelnut, what does that mean? Yeah, so hazelnut, I mean, there's 30 some species of hazelnut around the world. It's Coralis cornuta is the one that grows here. It's a native shrubby perennial nut plant. It is in the birch family. It's the cousin of alder and birch. The hazelnut that you get at the grocery store that folks are more familiar with is the Coralis avelina. That's the domesticated hazelnut, which was domesticated probably four or 5,000 years ago around the area of Turkey. And uh, Turkey is, is one of the biggest producers of that nut globally today. But yeah, as I said, there's the the native species here. It's very similar. Instead of a tree, it's more of a shrub and the nuts are a tad smaller than the domesticated variety and there's fewer nuts per cluster. So a few differences there, but it's a very common understory shrub throughout some parts of BC. (laughs) Yes. And where I live as well, and my forest as well, we have lots of hazelnuts. Actually, there's one in the front yard. I don't get many of them. The squirrels, the, the squirrels get them. The squirrels get them. Is the... Yeah. I mean, there's a fun way for dealing with that. And I should say I'm on some Shanlach up right now. There are some elders that I work very closely with up north here in Gixan and some Shan territory. My house is on some Shanlach up, specifically Kitsilis territory. But, um, you know, it's very common for elders to talk about raiding squirrel caches because it is really hard to beat the squirrels and the jays in these large hazelnut groves that look so promising. And then you show up one day to collect and they're all gone. And so they raid caches and never taking the whole cache, always leaving something in the cache for the mm-hmm. squirrel. There's there's really neat literature around cache raiding globally. It's really interesting. And, and the squirrels play this important part in that they collect all the nuts, but they also clean them. So they remove that involucry, which is a very abrasive cover. Yeah. (laughs) And it has asbestos in it and the prickles can stay on your hands too. So it, the squirrel provides this fantastic service of cleaning those off Mm -hmm. and then storing them all in one spot. So squirrel, squirrel cash rating is, is definitely up there on the cool ways to harvest food. In the north. I'm so glad we're talking about squirrels too. My actually, my dad has a fascination with squirrels, and uh, I don't know. It's one of those topics he can talk about for a while. So maybe he'll listen to a sh- one of these podcasts finally for once. What does he? <laughs> what does he like about them particularly? He just likes to watch them. When he, he lived in West Seattle, he would buy peanuts for them and just watch them and like watch the interactions with the cat. And, everything. <laughs> and then he just recently moved a while back, and he's like, "Yeah," and then there's this red brownish squirrel and i was like oh that might be a chipmunk or that might be actually the native squirrel he's like what there's native squirrels and he's like where's the gray squirrel from i was like i don't know the east coast or you know somewhere else but they're here now so he's really into gray squirrels his buddies that's um interesting i mean the hazelnuts and squirrels have this very deep lasting relationship in a lot of the tsimshian lore here the name winem diech actually means food of the squirrel and there's there's a really neat relationship there, this multi-species interaction that occurs between human squirrels and hazelnuts. It's pretty neat. Wow. 
I mean, I had some idea, definitely. I mean, we I have some hazelnuts now that are popping up. I do pick them out because they're just, they're sort of the squirrel plants them inappropriately, like not where I want them. <laughs> I've let a couple go, so we'll see. Now, I have a question for you yep. in, in the context of restoration. I remember when I was doing my research more intensively on hazelnut about five or six years ago, I came across a study in, was it Oregon or Washington, but using hazelnut as a slope stabilizer. So in a lot of areas where the ground cover has been completely removed, apparently hazelnut can take root very quickly, establish a bit mm. of a no horizon within a reasonable amount of time. Have you come across any of that? Hmm, yeah, there are these definitely some species that are sort of mythical in the yeah, they get put <laughs> in the literature about being good soil stabilizers. I think vine maple as well is one that's oh, usually okay. cited. I feel like too, it's one that occupies that middle story of the forest. You said like it's like a tall shrub, you know, small tree. So it definitely can provide some cover on that middle place in the forest between the big conifers and any any shrubs. So Yes, I often actually, we actually have sometimes not the best luck establishing them in Seattle's forests anyway. I don't know, because they will grow, if they come up on their own, really, I think they're pretty relatively shade tolerant. But then, yeah, I don't think they do the best. Sometimes we just see some spots where they just fry, you know, they're out in the oh, full yeah. sun. And sometimes we just... Young hazelnut wants water. It wants, mm -hmm. it likes its feet wet sometimes. Yeah, if unfortunately, you, you just can't water everything. Yeah. That's kind of the antithesis of like a permaculture system, right? Is this resource input that you want to limit. And so lots of watering is tough. But hazelnut's funny. It's it's one of those plants that when I pick up a guidebook, I, I always look to see if hazelnut's in there. And first thing I look at is how they describe its habitat and ecology. And it's always, you know, oh, shade tolerant. Or sometimes it's, oh, sun loving, open forest, like must grow open forest. Oh, it likes messic soils no it likes dry soils i mean it just no <laughs> one seems customers. to have consensus yeah which makes me think That's okay weird. either the it's just this highly adaptive plant and the writer is just talking about their own experience with it and where it grows or which we've looked at a lot is is okay is the distribution abnormal because of human intended transplanting and movement are humans moving it to areas where it may be doesn't typically grow, but seems to be succeeding for one reason or another because of human management and human care. And we see that in places like Northwestern BC, there's a big disjunct population that occupies numerous valleys near the town of Hazleton, named after, of course, it's hazelnuts. Mm -hmm. And it is the dominant understory in a lot of areas, and it should not be growing there. So in preparing for our conversation, I picked up my guidebook that I sort of grew up with was a Pojar McKinnon. That's like totally. um, Plants of the Pacific Northwest, right? I don't know if you all yeah, use yeah. that one too. Oh yeah, that's so the Bible in the up red here. book. Yeah, the Red Bible. Yeah, so I was <laughs> I was actually looking at it the other day, and it very explicit in the bottom about the range boundary. They talk yeah. about Hazleton, wherever that is. So yeah, it's actually just an hour from where, or an hour and a half from where I am in in Terrace. It's Gixan territory, and it's a strange distribution. And we have a genetic study. I have a genetic study in the works with my colleague Sarah Wickham and Andrew Trent. Where we're, I've sampled over 400 leaf tissues of hazelnut. And we're just looking at the genetics to see what kind of phytogeography is actually occurring, if there are any flags. But interestingly, Nancy Turner and I have done some research on this and following this idea that it's an intensively used plant. So we know ethnographically it has, it's the Swiss army knife of the plant world. It hangs out around people, i.e. archaeological sites. The nut is great because it doesn't take a lot of processing to store, right? You just harvest it and it keeps well for years. The oils that are produced by the shell are Excellent medicine, commonly cited as an important medicine. The mm -hmm. root, the root produces a blue dye, which is you know one of the hardest colors to get in nature, and so that was cited as a very important use. The shoots, of course, are, are very famously used in, in weaving and bow making, and, and it's just a very flexible hardwood. So it's this awesome plant. People love it. It's used. And it's occurring in these kind of strange distributions near where people have hung out for thousands of years. We're talking, you know, 15 plus thousand years. So 
What's interesting about the hazelnut in this disjunct area, and I urge your listeners to maybe go look because it is this start dot on the on the BC landscape. The hazelnut morphologically looks more like a California hazelnut, which comes from the south, rather than the cornuta cornuta. There's a different taxonomy, sometimes different species, different varieties, but there's a cornuta cornuta, cornuta californica. And this one in the north looks more like the California variety, which is really strange because you would think it looks more like its closest neighbor, which is the cornuta cornuta. Right. So... Nancy and I looked at some of the paleobiolinguistics, and in fact, the term for hazelnut in Gixan country is done referring to any shrub, and the root morpheme tzach, meaning the nut, and that is the identical word to Proto Salish, to the Proto Salish word for hazelnut. And these are entirely different language families. It's impossible that they're cognates. So we think it was very likely a loan word. And probably a transplanted nut to the north that people brought north from the south, from the coast. And so for your non-Canadian listeners that aren't familiar with Canadian geography, Vancouver is about, you know, 800 kilometers south from this disjunct. And it would be coming from that Vancouver area. Very long time Mm -hmm. ago. So probably moved by people, you know, by foot or by canoe over, yeah, several generations it's crazy. Yeah. And then naturalizing in some cases, you know, now it's just at some area in this Hazelton region, it's it's very much the dominant understory, like I said. But then as you leave that area, it hazelnut only starts to show up at archaeological village sites or on reserve, i.e. where, where people are living, where people are hanging out. Mm-hmm. And so that prefaced our research into, okay, well, maybe it's not just hazelnut. Maybe there's these bigger landscapes <laughs> that are being managed and maintained. All right. So hazelnut, you know, generally there is a question I ask it. I usually leave it towards the end, but obviously I think you've uh, told us that hazelnut is your favorite tree. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I've actually, scratched, I was listening to other episodes. That. Yeah, I thought, oh no, I can't say hazelnut because I probably will talk about it. And it's technically not a shree. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a shrub. And I, <laughs> so there we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we'll just leave it, okay. leave it there. <laughs> Yeah, right. Since you mentioned eating it and squirrels definitely are specialized in it. I don't think many people, I think besides like putting it in their lattes or whatever, like people (laughs) have no clue and probably don't eat it. Some people will like just sun dry them and the involucry kind of shrinks and, and dries out and that's a nice way. But yeah, and then you need like a nutcracker or something to open it. The, I think the commercial hazelnut so the Coralis avellina or avellana, I think, I think something like fifty percent of the world's production of hazelnut goes towards Nutella and Ferrero Rocher. Yeah, I had a hazel, I had a Nutella problem a few years ago, so it's like kind of banned. It's banned from the house <laughs> now. I'll allow it because uh, no so one else funny. eats it. I'll just like roll it up in a burrito. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Let's not talk about it. Okay. Cool. Woo, hazelnut. So you talked about that hazelnuts are sort of this indicator on the landscape that definitely people have brought it there and cultivated it and tended it, and that there's a larger cultural landscape as well. And what led me to reach out to you is this paper you recently you recently published with some co-writers talking about forest gardens. So I was wondering if you could give us some depiction of what forest gardens look and feel like compared to other forest types. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll just give a shout out to my co-authors, Jesse Miller, Alex McAlvey at Stanford and the New York Botanical Garden, respectively, and then uh, Morgan Ritchie and Dana Lepofsky, who are archaeologists. Yeah, so this paper, I mean, it was a, it was in the works for quite a while as we were trying to figure out what is happening at these ecosystems that don't look like what we usually encounter on the Northwest Coast. So they are, you can imagine a a broadly forest. I mean, I'm originally from Northern Ontario, so, you know, I'm a little more uh, used to broadly forests. Uh, Those are very uncommon out here, Northwestern BC. And so walking into these spaces is is just a very stark contrast to your typical conifer dominant landscape. So on the coast, things like hemlock, Douglas fir, red cedar, and then spruce and firs, If if you go up bit in elevation things change a bit but but generally you're when the landscape is left to its own devices it will turn into a conifer forest within a few generations so that wasn't happening at these these places directly adjacent to archaeological village sites and so 
think of it as a broadleaf forest, but then if you look at the species composition, they're all really ethnobotanically important plants, things that I would eat, things that elders talk about either managing or using for medicines or what ethnobotanists would call culturally salient plants, plants that are important to the culture, not just in this super functional way, but just plants that play a role in day-to-day life. And so these are things like Pacific crabapple, hazelnut, of course, wild cherries, Highbush cranberry, red elderberry, Saskatoon berry, black hawthorn, and this mid to mid canopy shrub layer, and then in the lower layers, a ton of vaccinium species, rubus species, things like wild ginger and rice root, just really this incredibly diverse food shed. Again, showing up exclusively adjacent to archaeological village sites. So this very obvious pattern of hanging around hanging out around people. And that's what brought us to think about these as forest gardens, which of course is a common term used around the world for all types of arboriculture and different times of forest cultivation. So in the neotropics especially, but also in sub-Saharan Africa with island forests, forest gardens around Indonesia and in the South Pacific. It's a really common thing globally. We just hadn't totally seen it yet here in North America. Of course, Indigenous peoples have. Scientists are just late to the game as always. Right, right. I don't know what that was, top 10, top 12, 15 <laughs> species. I feel like they're they're pretty fairly popular plants that we, we add to restorations. Often mm. we say they're for the birds, you know, for the habitat. But the way you're talking about them, it's like birds and other animals will, will use them for sure too because like they're yummy. But it looks like people cultivated them and moved them around, sort of created them and maintained them for mm-hmm. who knows how long. Yeah, absolutely. And that was one of the main findings of the paper that you mentioned was just how incredible these ecosystems are as habitat and as resources for animals and pollinators. We, we looked at the functional traits co-occurring in forest gardens and conifer forests and the frequency of animal pollinated and animal dispersed species was much higher in the forest gardens. The overall seed mass was much higher in the forest gardens. And seed mass is interesting because a a larger seed typically means a larger fruit. And that's the economically uh, important part for uh, humans and animals, right? That's the part you eat. And so these are just what were once important food stores for people in the past continue to provide these exceptional functions in the present by way of animal habitat uh, and, and various resources. And that, of course, contradicts a lot of studies on human landscape use, which tend to overturn or reduce diversity. Right. I mean, you sparked my my imagination because actually right now, like this week, I started doing a deep dive on making my plant list for next season, right? Mm-hmm. So we'll, we'll be planting. I feel like so proud of myself because I'm kind of ahead of the game. And I'm always like a little um, hopeful to <laughs> the spring because we rolled out some work. And so we're looking at, you know, October, November when we're going to start planting. I don't know whether it's archaeologists or anthropologists. Sometime in the future, we'll probably be looking at our restorations at some point in time. They'll see this signature of different plants that were like, I fancied, you know, at some yeah. point like <laughs> yeah. in my career. So you'll see, like I just walked through a forest the other day with some neighbors and you could see like the vine maples and cascaras. And then now I think this year, having read your work and talking to you, I'm like hawthorns and crab apples. <laughs> There's going to be so many hawthorns and crab apples. Yeah. Or, you know, like what is, what is your relationship with the communities around you and what were they growing Mm -hmm. and what are they talking about? I mean, they're the original scientists and horticulturalists of the region. So that's one thing that this article got a lot of press and, and sometimes the headlines were a little misleading around, Oh, you know, forest gardens discovered and it's just such a horrible way to put it because the communities I work with, the Simshan, Gixang communities and, and Chehalis communities, I mean, they've always known these places existed and they've always had this knowledge of what to cultivate where. And I think about that with restoration and reclamation um, of, of various sites, whether it's after, you know, logging or pipeline development, you know, what plants are being put back there. So to hear you talk about perennials, I mean, the fact that you're putting in 
Vine maples and cascara, that sounds like a well ahead of the game here. Seems to be a lot of like clover, things that maybe not invasive, but non-native species are common. And it's really interesting. Like, mm-hmm. What is the decision-making process in informing what plants go where? And how much are we talking with indigenous Ooh, communities? Such a good question. It is a good <laughs> question. So a couple of things I'd like to unpack about what you just said. One was uh, using that term discovery. If I forget, let's go back to okay. using that, yeah, that <laughs> yeah. term that was thrown around for sure. Like, yeah, the first ever discovery. Mm-hmm. Like no one ever knew about this. I feel like that's an important thing to talk about. Yeah, but then, you know, my process for making plant lists, sometimes it's um it can seem very arbitrary, mm-hmm. I think. It's sometimes it's dictated by definitely what's available. So if we don't right. grow it ourselves, we purchase it. So it's kind of like whatever's in the store, right? Like whatever right. is like the nurseries are providing. And sometimes they are just like these dominant, like we can always find Western red cedar. <laughs> we can right. always find by maple. They're just out there. And some of these more little niche species or some other less common species, like you definitely have to like collect it and grow it yourself. Yeah. And oftentimes too, it depends on the program. So different restorationists, like if they work for a water utility that does reforestation, or if it's you're a forester for a timber company, it depends which outcome you're looking for, right? So if you're mm-hmm. looking for a species that's economically viable, they can sell later, right? It's like all about Douglas fir and growing like monocultures of Douglas fir, right? You can care less about vine maple, like vine maple just gets in the way, right? But for me, working for our parks and recreation, our program has been built on growing future healthy forests and diversifying the forest. So really what we have now through settler colonialism the last couple hundred years and the Boeing company, which made airplanes, right? Oh, right, right, right. So like spruce, zero spruce. We can find like, no, we know spruce historically occurred here. No spruce because those just like went into airplane wings you know, oh, World no War II probably, yeah, for sure. So my point is, especially in urban areas, there's just the ecosystems have been wholly transformed and the seed sources sometimes we don't have. And so what's grown back normally, what dominates the forest in Seattle and around the coast in the Salish Sea, Puget Sound, it's a lot of just really just big leaf maple and red. Yeah, like, red alder. We've, that's like our huge. Yeah, yeah, so much. We have lots of edge, so much edge. And so we have lots of mm. opportunities to diversify things in the, in the mid story. Um, but we do decentralize the plant selection process. We have volunteers out there and they make their own decisions planting their own parks. So people come armed with you know, different levels of like, quote unquote, training and mm-hmm. people are you know, making decisions. People are like plant geeks. So they're always trying to you know, tinkering mm-hmm. with it like a garden. But I would say, I think it's very important what you just said, consulting with if not like true engagement with indigenous peoples about what they want, because we're all living on all the park land is all stolen land. Right. So, and it is, uh, I think it's very important to try to develop the activities you were talking about with forest gardens, like the foraging or using plants for food and medicine and fiber. A lot of times it's either invisibilized or it's outlawed outright. Right. So Mm -hmm. I think we've, Mm -hmm. we've done, we um, have done a pretty good job of dispossessing people of land and, and culture and the practices mm-hmm. and restoration. Not only it can be part of that healing, I think some of the ecological violence that's happened over the last 500 years. Yeah, and that's a good way to put it. Just we go towards revitalizing forest garden spaces in complete collaboration and there there is a hierarchy of who's running it and it, it is Kitslas and it is Shahelis. They've self-organized their own forest garden working groups headed by elders and teachers on how to bring these places back and we're kind of facilitating that from the more quote scientific perspective. I was thinking though like how with a bit of the publicity around the article I've had a lot of folks from all over Canada and the U.S. asking about bringing these back so like non-indigenous entities and NGOs and stuff and Daniel Wildcat is an indigenous uh, scholar writer thinker ecologist and he wrote about this idea of they erased our knowledge and now they're relying on us to save the world and it's this terrible irony that's not lost on me and, and countless other 
scholars, but needs to be said. It's almost like, oh, forest gardens, perfect. We'll just do this. There's almost like a like a techno fix philosophy around it, you know, instead of dealing with the root of mm-hmm. white supremacy. Or, okay. you know, we've logged this area to shit. Let's put a forest garden in there as this quick fix to something that's a problem that is a lot deeper and bigger. And that's, you know, relentless resource extraction without consent or, you know, these other issues that kind of get played off as a one-time thing. So for example, yeah, let's, we've logged here, let's put a forest garden. Great. We're happy. You know, that that's its own issue. But also as you probably deal with is this issue of scale, you know, someone in the interior of the province saying, hey, let's build a forest garden. Well, that's not your, it's, that's a totally different bioregion with different people and different relationships to, you know, the forest canopy, the forest plants. It's not something you can just scale up and adopt here, here, and here, right? And it's, it's again, these quick fixes or quick solutions to something that should be apprehended very slowly and carefully and with the right people. Right. And do you think it's really, there's site, you always use this term, so cliche, like very site specific, right? Context specific. So exporting even species, I guess. How do you feel about using species that may be somewhat foreign to the landscape that you find yourself situated in? Yeah. Again, that's like from a ecological perspective, there might be some important functions that non-native species play. From a, you know, ethnobotanical perspective, I know the late Kitsilas elder Wilfred Bennett talked about common tansy as an important plant for him and his family. And and there are various uses that he discussed. And, And that's kind of one of those plants that we constantly look down on. My friend and colleague, Nick Rio has written lots about this and just our relationship to invasive species. And I think you may have talked about it. You, I listened to the episode on, on weeds and I, I think there was a piece in the introduction that cited mm-hmm. his paper. And yeah, that's... I did. I did reference it. I'm glad I, was like, <laughs> I listened to it. And Ogden, Laura as well, I think co-wrote. No. Yeah. So I mean, yep. that's... That was that's, good. That was such a good article. Yeah. Right. And such an important kind of rethinking or, or tinkering with how we relate to species in the in the kind of western science sense versus on the ground in reality you know can i eat this can i forage this does this have a connection to you know my grandparents or my great grandparents we see all the time like we talk about management as a suite of practices and we often just look at those mechanical functional aspects of management without considering, you know, the the social institutions, the relationality, the the, you know, quote cultural aspects are, are often downplayed. And Fickrit Berkey's and Nancy Turner have talked a lot about this. But the best example is like the the fish weir. You know, there's scientists now saying, so this is a very globally, weirs have been used for thousands of years. They're really great technology, really adaptive technology, but they were outlawed in Canada under the Indian Act. They were seen as wasteful, problematic technologies, which we now know they're not. And the DFO, so the Department of Fisheries and Oceans in Canada, is starting to see this. People are starting, oh, you know, weirs were actually a good idea. So let's reinstate them. You know, let's start using weirs again. And what's missing from that is it's not just the the weir technology per se, it was the act of selective harvesting. It was that weirs were controlled by specific governance structures and stewardship models that enforced seasonal limits. You know, it wasn't just about the technology and you can't just replicate the technology and expect salmon numbers to rebound, right? It's the the management strategy is still a stockpiling strategy of fishing as many, you know, getting as many salmon as you can. The weir's not going to fix that. So any management strategy like forest gardens, where we try to mimic successful management strategies in the past that we try to mimic for the future, they're often missing those really important pieces. And so that's another consideration with forest gardens and people asking, oh, let's do that or let's build one. You know, I'm I'm a little weary there. I think time scale as well over time, because um, it's one thing to start it and build it. But when is the project complete? It's oh, like, interesting. Is it, is it a three-year project? 
you know, like you said, some of these forest gardens could have been, you know, centuries old. Like how do you... Maybe longer, yeah. Man, yeah. How do you manage over that time scale? It's just, it's mind boggling to mm -hmm. me, I think, to the kind of Western like, colonial science for sure. It's like, mm -hmm. how do these things evolve? I'm not sure if you're familiar with Oliver Rackham's work. No. Oh, I think you'd enjoy. I think okay. your listeners might enjoy it. But he taught no, his famous book is as Woodlands. It's a fantastic read. He basically it, he's a historical ecologist, and he is based in the UK and talks about just forest management over millennia in the UK. And there's not a, a wild forest left in the UK or in Europe. So even when you think you're in a forest, it's you know kind of successionally wild or, or it. You, you turn a corner and trees look, you can see the evidence of coppicing that are maybe a couple hundred years old, like mm -hmm. lots of coppice, mm -hmm. coppicing mm -hmm. the thing, you know, especially, which makes sense, mm -hmm. you know, if you deforest an area and you need uh, fuel, you're going to coppice for, for branches and, and use that right, as your right. fuel. Um, right. And next week, I'm going to talk, to, we're going to talk live stakes and willows and coppicing next uh, week. Oh, fantastic. It'll be, a future, it'll be a future episode, yeah. Great segue then. They, <laughs> but yeah. that, you know, that time scale. As an archaeologist, too, I mean, we're constantly thinking about and all the, the kind of theoretical underpinnings of archaeology are dealing with this issue of temporal scale. And then in historical ecology, we're primarily working at the landscape scale. And that's really tough to reconcile, i.e. the landscape through time. And realistically, forest gardens are probably, well, we look at them now and they are a bit grown over. They're a little tired. The Malus fusca, the Pacific crab apples are, are quite overgrown. Lots of epiphytes, mosses, lichens are just kind of dragging it down. So in bringing them back, we're kind of, we're, we're thinking, okay, well, let's bring them back to what they looked like when? 20 years ago? 100 years ago? 1,000 years ago? Mm -hmm. And how are we going to create that? Or, or how are we going to measure success in that way? And I think that's what you're getting to is, is, this issue of scale is, is mm -hmm. very prevalent, especially when we talk about is our work done? Yeah, it, it really gets you thinking. Yeah, I know. Well, tinkering, I mean, definitely, I think restorationists were definitely inclined to tinker with the ecosystem. And I think historically, where the science or the practice, it really was previously focused on restoring back Mm -hmm. toward some arbitrary moments in the past, right? But more and more, I think with the environmental change, like rapid environmental change, climate change in specifically, we see that sometimes um, with, you know, massive disturbances, sometimes that historical analog or the historical forest or ecosystem, we can't really we can dump as much resources like labor and investment, financial resources into it, but we may never get that snapshot back, mm -hmm. snapshot of time back. So I think we're either um, just to kind of let the communities assemble on their own and see how it goes or, or just managing for some just future, future change. The food sovereignty movement, if it is a monolith, which it absolutely isn't, but I know a, a large portion of that considers reclamation and, and managing succession for, for food, right? That that's the target. That there's there's all these different kinds of, of functions or angles, depending on who you talk to. It's a very rel relative thing. But I like that one. I think, oh, okay. Managing successions, letting it go a bit, right? Letting ecosystem processes do their mm -hmm. thing. But then lending that hand in to maybe increase the proclivity and productivity of desired foods that might be, you know, a pathway forward for some folks. For sure. I would encourage everyone to kind of supplement their diets with some sort of, you know, wild foods mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. they gather on their own. I feel like I think so many people are freaked out about potential, like there is definitely a risk of some toxins or some herbicide, you know, in the landscape. So you got to be careful, you know, where you collect from. But I mean, it's, I don't think it's much more dangerous than eating from like an industrial food system, right? So <laughs> it's enough. like, yeah. what are you yeah. getting off, of, you know, the shelf <laughs> um, that's wrapped in plastic, really, right? So mm -hmm. I think it is a good way to dip your toes into it, right? Because I think in some ways, I mean, a vast majority of folks that I work with, like volunteers or stewards or restorationists, like sometimes, like I work for uh, Seattle Parks and Recreation System, right? So we engage with the work 
tradition is like kind of like recreation. So it's, it's kind of different. And people think like, oh, this is just meant to be for the animals and habitat. And there should be like as light touch as possible. But I think more and more we see how I think restorations can be part of part of food systems i don't think it necessarily um occurs to every everyone that everyone in every every restoration that people could have this sort of relationship with the forest you know that's a big debate right now is mm-hmm. this kind of idea of biodiversity and agriculture or food production i should say as being inherently incompatible you cannot have biodiverse food production it just doesn't work at the level that the or at the scale that we need globally that's the important distinction. Globally, these, this idea of biodiversity and food production is, is at odds. And I just, it's a really interesting debate. And I see both sides of it, particularly in terms of scale. But I think it just mm-hmm. requires a, a real reordering and shifting and, you know, kind of radical decolonizing of our, our food systems, of how we manage landscapes. And, and it's, yeah, it's a big, a big one. And based on, you know, where, where I am in Washington State, I mean, we're sort of like a breadbasket, but it is mm-hmm. fueled on, you know, the way we're able to irrigate all that land is through dams, which right. like block the salmon, changes the rivers and the hydrological cycles of so, so dramatically, mm-hmm. right? So mm-hmm. it's huge reclamation yeah. projects. And at some point, actually, I think what we, we've talked about recently in a couple episodes back was just how obsolete gray infrastructure, like big dams can be, yeah. you know, 50 yeah, yeah. 100 years down the road. So yeah, I think totally. there's uh, there might be some hazelnuts we grow. Do you have any advice or lessons learned for ecological practitioners or for folks interested in historical or ethno-ecological research? Yeah. So my lab uh, is based in Indigenous Studies at SFU. And, you know, it's in that department because Indigenous Studies is such a an exquisitely diverse place for scholars that are traversing disciplinary boundaries and and really kind of pushing the envelope on um, how white supremacy has has really infiltrated a lot of academic research. And then that, of course, spills over into our day-to-day lives and policies that we abide by, you know. So it's a really great place. And I I think that for students interested in this kind of inherently multidisciplinary field, you know, you have to be kind of trained in the natural sciences and the social sciences equally. It can be very daunting and challenging. And so I always say it's counterintuitive, but I always tell students to stick with one field, become proficient in a skill or something you're interested in, but always branch out kind of at that higher level to to bigger debates and ideas. And what I mean by that is I see a lot of these kind of programs coming out that are very multidisciplinary and it produces students that are maybe they come to the field and they're like, okay, what am I doing? You know, maybe they don't know how to identify plants or maybe they, you know, but they've taken a few ecology courses or maybe they don't. And, you know, if you're working particularly as a settler, if you're working with and for indigenous communities like you better be bringing a skill to the table, like otherwise you're wasting their time. And so, you know, I really encourage students to find something they enjoy and and get good at it. Become like the jack of all trades thing is important. But so for example, in our lab, you know, we do everything from charcoal identification. So anthropology to paleoethnobotany. This is a subfield of archaeology where we excavate bulk samples of soil and then we float them and all the charred plant remains rise to the top and we identify those in an effort to recreate, you know, ancient landscapes, ancient diets, if it's in an archaeological context. We do a lot of dendroecology, you know, we count rings on trees. We do this kind of, at times, data-heavy work in order to answer the cool questions that everyone wants to answer. So my advice is to find a skill, become good at it, but stay in those higher level conversations. Yeah, I think that's solid advice. You got to bring some skills yeah. in whatever it is. Bring something to the table, totally. Handy skills like plant identification. Plant ID. That's my superpower. My superpower is just noticing things and I point to them. <laughs> do you, Do your friends always talk about like if there is an inevitable apocalypse? Like mm. you're you're first on their list because of all your plant knowledge. I mean, I, I get don't this know all the how time. Well, I will be. 
I mean, some people, some people have been living through the apocalypse. So I'm like whether or not, whether or not, yeah, this is a good conversation. I'm glad you brought that up because I was trying to, yeah, how would we ever insert this theme into the podcast about the apocalypse? You know, honestly, yeah, I don't know if you know, I'm wearing contacts, very high prescription okay. contacts. Okay. So I don't know how well I'm going to do. Oh yeah. You're gone in like four days. Yeah, I know. Yeah. It's so terrible. Yeah. So I might just have to like hang out by the garden. And just not move around very much. Lanicera, the black twinberry, is used as a an eye wash for for sight and cataracts. There really? you go. You can yeah. maybe make yeah. A... My contacts degrade or my glasses <laughs> break. Maybe I'll have to figure out some way to heal myself. Do you want to provide a way for people to get in touch with you in your lab? On my website, so chelseageralda dot com, and my email's there. I'm not on Twitter or anything. I probably should be, no. but I'm just... Don't worry about it. I haven't found the time. Yeah, who has the time? Yeah. And a shout out to <laughs> um, to the Society of Ethnobiology. That's, as I said, I'm an archaeologist, but I grew up in that society. It's my intellectual home. And so I really urge folks to check them out. Nonprofit society, really great student uh, involvement and student opportunities, lots of grants for Indigenous students. They're just great. All right. Great. Thanks so much for being on the podcast. Oh, it was so fun. Yeah. Great podcast. Big fan. Thanks for finding Tree Hugger Podcast again and tuning into this discussion with Professor Chelsea Armstrong. Please take the listener survey if you can. One can find the link right now in the show description in your app, the Tree Hugger website, or the Tree Hugger Instagram profile. There are just a few questions about preferred length of the episodes, where you found me, your desires, what you might hate. That's it. And if you submit something and drop your mailing address, I will send you a tree hugger sticker. If you opened up the survey when I first started talking about it, you would probably be done by now. You can now donate to the show. At the tree hugger website, there's a PayPal link. Podcasting isn't free, people. If you are in the position to donate some funds, it would help me offset some of the show's costs. Thanks for considering. I appreciate you joining me again for another episode of Tree Hugger Podcast. I'm Michael Yadrick. Please check the show description for information about Chelsea Armstrong. Or you can find more about her online at treehuggerpod.com. We are on social media at treehuggerpod, so feel free to point people in our direction. Subscribe, rate, and review the show, please, on whichever podcast platform you enjoy listening to. It helps people find the show. Or tell a friend about the show. The music for the show you heard from Reed Mathis. One can find a link to them in the show description. Thanks for hanging out.